Salutam, I am Vandari and this video is an analysis of Walter Benjamin's essay called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. For this video I used the latest version of the text that was authorized by Walter Benjamin himself and that version is from 1939. Keep that in mind if you want to use another version. Um, I linked the English translation I used in the description and here you can see all the printed editions I used. This analysis will focus on the argumentation of Walter Benjamin and of course the understanding of the essay. This means that certain philosophical or historical or artistic aspects of that essay have to be ignored. This is the first of three videos and it will deal with the preface and the chapters 1 to 6. For anyone who is able to understand German, uh, go check out the German version I made of this video. Now the video will start. Yeah, it will start now. The preface of Walter Benjamin's essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, or the Artwork Essay for short, starts with a quote by Paul Valéry. Our fine arts were developed, their types and uses were established, in times very different from the present, by men whose power of action upon things was insignificant in comparison with ours. But the amazing growth of our techniques, the adaptability and the precision they have attained, the ideas and habits they are creating, make it a certainty that profound changes are impending in the ancient craft of the beautiful. In all the arts, there is a physical component which can no longer be considered or treated as it used to be, which cannot remain unaffected by our modern knowledge and power. For the last 20 years, neither matter, nor space, nor time has been what it was from time immemorial. We must expect great innovations to transform the entire technique of the arts, thereby affecting artistic invention itself and perhaps even bringing about an amazing change in our very notion of art. With this quote, Walter Benjamin intended to show the necessity of a new scientific investigation of the arts. Right after the introductory quote, he comes back to the theories of Karl Marx. He explains in short terms how Karl Marx investigated the conditions of the society within the capitalistic mode of production, and that these investigations by Karl Marx made it possible to understand the development of this system. These are the kind of prognostic thesis Walter Benjamin wants to achieve through his own investigations, as he further develops the base superstructure model. At this point, I would like to step back from the analysis for a moment, in order to explain the base superstructure model within two sentences. In Marxism, one understands society as a pair of complementary categories which influence each other. While the base is formed by the mode of production, that is forms of property and labor, as well as the productive forces, the superstructure is the ideological expression of the base and is formed by all cultural and legal components, but also includes the state and its institutions. For Walter Benjamin, the last half century is the perfect object to investigate in order to find those theses, since the transformation of the superstructure now finally catched up to the previous transformation of the base. The transformation of the superstructure, which takes place far more slowly than that of the substructure, has taken more than half a century to manifest in all areas of culture the change in the conditions of production. Only today can be indicated what form this has taken. Like Marx, Walter Benjamin wants to use the thesis he comes up with during the investigation for creating prognosis for the future development of society. Quote, Certain prognostic requirements should be met by these statements. End quote. This means that the previous transformation has to contain information about current and future transformations. Quote, However, thesis about the art of the proletariat after its assumption of power or about the art of a class of society would have less bearing on these demands than the thesis about the developmental tendencies of art under present conditions of production. End quote. We see that the transformation of the superstructure is not yet over, since the transformation of the base or substructure is not or will never be over. In fact, we are talking about capitalism as an ongoing process. Walter Benjamin now wants to point out these theses about the developmental tendencies in the superstructure in this essay. He justifies that with this quote. Their dialectic is no less noticeable in the superstructure than in the economy, 
It would therefore be wrong to underestimate the value of such thesis as a weapon. End quote. Since we know the role of the superstructure as maintaining and influencing the base, this should be clear. Quote, they brush aside a number of outmoded concepts, such as creativity and genius, eternal value and mystery, concepts whose uncontrolled, and at present almost uncontrollable, application would lead to a processing of data in the fascist sense. At this point, we find the way towards the new materialist art theory Walter Benjamin wants to establish. Quote, the concepts which are introduced into the theory of art in what follows differ from the more familiar terms in that they are completely useless for the purposes of fascism. They are, on the other hand, useful for the formulation of revolutionary demand in the politics of art. End quote. And this shows the political claim of Walter Benjamin's artwork essay. Walter Benjamin starts chapter 1 with the differentiation of normal and mechanical reproduction. He writes, quote, Man-made artifacts could always be imitated by man. Replicas were made by pupils in practice of their craft, by masters for diffusing their works, and finally by third parties in the pursuit of gain. To summarize this, art always got replicated. It was always possible to do so. Regarding the mechanical reproduction, Walter Benjamin writes, the mechanical reproduction of a work of art, however, represents something new. Historically, it advanced intermittently and in leaps at long intervals, but with accelerated intensity. He then shows this through the development of mechanical reproduction throughout history. Because the ancient Greeks only knew founding and stamping as methods of mechanical reproduction, bronzes, terracottas and coins were the only artworks which they could produce in quantity. As time went by, with the woodcut, it became possible to replicate graphic art in a mechanical way. With a printing press, script became mechanically replicatable. Later, engraving and etching were invented, and in the 19th century, lithography. Regarding this new technique, Walter Benjamin writes, With lithography, the technique of reproduction reached an essentially new stage. This much more direct process permitted graphic art for the first time to put its product on the market, not only in large numbers as hitherto, but also in daily changing forms. Finally, photography made its appearance, which was significantly different to all the other previous techniques in one regard. Quote, For the first time in the process of pictorial reproduction, photography freed the hand of the most important artistic functions, which henceforth devolved only upon the eye looking into a lens. With other words, instead of using a lot of time in the production process of art, like writing a text or creating a graphic, the process is reduced to a minimum due to the eye taking over the decision what the content of the artwork should be. Quote, Since the eye perceives more swiftly than the hand can draw, the process of pictorial reproduction was accelerated so enormously that it could keep pace with speech. We see, Walter Benjamin already derives from this faster production process of photography, the birth of the movie. Quote, Just as lithography virtually implied the illustrated newspaper, so did photography foreshadow the sound film. The technical reproduction of sound was tackled at the end of the last century. After that, it follows another quote by Paul Valéry, which from nowadays perspective is an extraordinary correct prognosis of the future. Quote, Just as water, gas and electricity are brought into our houses from far off to satisfy our needs in response to a minimal effort, so we shall be supplied with visual or auditory images, which will appear and disappear at a simple movement of the hand, hardly more than a sign. End quote. It therefore followed that almost every artwork could get replicated mechanically. Yes, mechanical reproduction itself becomes art. Walter Benjamin puts it like this. Around 1900, technical reproduction had reached a standard that not only permitted it to reproduce all transmitted works of art and thus to cause the most profound change in their impact upon the public, 
It also had captured a place of its own among the artistic processes. Chapter 1 comes to an end with the transition to further topics in the artwork essay, in particular the art of film and the impact of the mechanical reproduction on art in general. Quote, For the study of this standard, nothing is more revealing than the nature of the repercussions that these two different manifestations, the reproduction of works of art and the art of the film, have had on art in its traditional form. With other words, in order to understand the standard, the stage of techniques, one has to look into the art of film and the impact of mechanical reproduction in the field of arts. In the second chapter of the artwork essay, Walter Benjamin talks about the properties of the mechanical reproduction. At first, he encounters the fact that even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. This presence in space and time, however, is the sole property of the artwork which is subject to change during its existence. So what does he mean with its unique existence at the place where it happens to be? Walter Benjamin differentiates between changes caused by time itself, such as aging and decay, and changes in the ownership of the artwork. The former can only be analyzed by means of physics and chemistry, since they only affect the physical structure of the work of art. The changes in ownership, on the other hand, are what Walter Benjamin really is interested in. They are the core of the history of the work of art. He makes a remark, which means he gives additional information besides the main text. Note 1. Of course, the history of a work of art encompasses more than this. The history of the Mona Lisa, for instance, encompasses the kind and number of its copies made in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. The analysis of this history and these changes of ownership are subject to a tradition which must be traced from the situation of the original. So, how does he define an original? He writes, The presence of the original is the prerequisite to the concept of authenticity. This, however, is not very precise. He writes, The whole sphere of authenticity is outside technical, and of course not only technical, reproducibility. In short terms, the authenticity of an artwork is not reproducible. Neither the technical reproduction nor any other form of reproduction is able to create another original besides the first original of an artwork. The next words of Walter Benjamin may therefore seem confusing. However, they carry the real meaning behind the difference between technical and normal reproduction. Confronted with its manual reproduction, which was usually branded as a forgery, the original preserved all its authority, not so via v technical reproduction. Let's look into some examples. There only exists one painting which can be called original. Neither means of mechanical reproduction, for instance to simply take a photo of this drawing, nor means of manual reproduction, for instance to draw the exact same painting, can create a second original. A photo of a painting also is never branded as forgery, since the photography never claimed to be the original. The form is too different. If one makes a random photo, so we are talking about mechanical reproduction as a creation process now, there is no original photo in the first place. Every replicated photo is as original as the first one, and vice versa. But if no photo is the original, none of the replicated photos has any kind of authority derived from its authenticity. With other words, there can't be authenticity in the process of mechanical reproduction. Now we will look to Walter Benjamin's note 2. Precisely because authenticity is not reproducible, the intensive penetration of certain mechanical processes of reproduction was instrumental in differentiating and grading authenticity. To develop such differentiations was an important function of the trade in works of art. This additional information Walter Benjamin has given us here indicates the ability of the technique of mechanical reproduction to question even the authenticity of long-known art. The trade of artworks protects itself through this differentiation and grading of authenticity, which means it introduces various levels or stages of authenticity a work of art can be categorized in. 
But why can the authenticity create the authority of an original painting and brand painted copies, i.e. manual reproductions, as forgery? And why isn't there any authority in the artwork created by mechanical reproduction? Walter Benjamin gives two reasons for that. First, process reproduction is more independent of the original than manual reproduction. For example, in photography, process reproduction can bring out those aspects of the original that are unattainable to the naked eye yet accessible to the lens, which is adjustable and chooses its angle at will. And photographic reproduction, with the aid of certain processes, such as enlargement or slow motion, can capture images which escape natural vision. So in a nutshell. Products created by mechanical reproduction may have an advantage in their usage in comparison with the original. Looking at the example of photography, one can easily understand the variety of usages of mechanical reproduction. In particular, we are talking about zooming, different focuses, but also the possibility to show new angles and many more things than what is possible through mere manual reproduction. Secondly, Technical reproduction can put the copy of the original into situations which would be out of reach for the original itself. Above all, it enables the original to meet the beholder halfway, be it in the form of a photograph or a phonograph record. The cathedral leaves its locale to be received in the studio of a lover of art. The choral production performed in an auditorium or in the open air resounds in the drawing room. This should explain itself. We can go into more examples than what Walter Benjamin gives us here. With illustrated newspapers or magazines, we can read at any time and place we want to. With the internet as the most recent example, it is even possible to have access to a whole library of videos, pictures, texts and songs, which we can consume anywhere and at any time. Walter Benjamin goes on. The situations into which the product of mechanical reproduction can be brought may not touch the actual work of art, yet the quality of its presence is always depreciated. This holds not only for the artwork, but also, for instance, for a landscape, which passes in review before the spectator in a movie. In the case of the art object, a most sensitive nucleus, namely its authenticity, is interfered with whereas no natural object is vulnerable on that score. The authenticity is described as the presence of the artwork. He explains, The authenticity of a thing is the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its substantive duration to its testimony to the history which it has experienced. Since the historical testimony rests on the authenticity, the former, too, is jeopardized by reproduction when substantive duration ceases to matter. And what is really jeopardized when the historical testimony is affected is the authority of the object. What Walter Benjamin is saying here is this. The historical testimony of a thing, i.e. everything what the artwork has experienced during its existence, is based upon its material, its physical existence. Authenticity is the whole of all events this artwork has experienced since its creation. He calls this all that is transmissible which means something that carries an already existing thing on into the future. The material existence or substantive duration of the thing expires through the introduction of mechanical reproduction, since this thing can be endlessly replicated. The single thing loses its physical existence in time. There are reproductions which simply replace it. For instance, if a photography is lost, one simply develops an identical photo. However, if this material existence fades away, the historical testimony also has to go. Who cares about the history of one single coin, if there are thousands, if not millions of identical copies? Therefore, once material existence and also historical testimony are gone, all that is transmissible is also gone. But this was a core, the essence of the authenticity. To summarize, the authority of the original of an artwork loses ground because of mechanical reproduction. Walter Benjamin now defines a central term in his materialist theory of art, the aura. One might subsume the eliminated element in the term aura and go on to say that which withers in the age of mechanical reproduction is the aura of the work of art. After that, he puts the aura in its place within his theory of art. This is a symptomatic process whose significance points beyond the realm of art.
With other words, the processes which lead to the decay of the aura, which lead to the elimination of authenticity, are just symptoms, but not the only effects of mechanical reproduction. In the base superstructure concept, this is easy to understand. The introduction of mechanical reproduction influences the productive forces, which are part of the base. In the superstructure, one can see this as the symptoms we have just covered. Looking back to the preface, one now can agree with Walter Benjamin that the analysis of art can also find knowledge about the development of society as a whole. Walter Benjamin summarizes the effects of the technique of mechanical reproduction that are, on the one hand, the high quantity of the reproduction and on the other hand the ability of the reproduction to meet the consumers halfway, i.e. let them consume the art at any given place and time. These two processes lead to a tremendous shattering of tradition, which is the obverse of the contemporary crisis and renewal of mankind. Both processes are intimately connected with the contemporary mass movements. We will look deeper into this connection later on. And their most powerful agent is the film. Its social significance, particularly in its most positive form, is inconceivable without its destructive, cathartic aspect, that is, the liquidation of the traditional value of the cultural heritage. This phenomenon is most palpable in the great historical films. Here Walter Benjamin tells us the results before he explains his analysis. Therefore we will look into this later in the artwork essay, when he comes back to the film. Chapter 3 The third chapter brings up the base superstructure model again. Walter Benjamin expands the superstructure by adding a sphere of perception, which depends on the historical circumstances. The differences in the perception can be seen in the arts. During long periods of history, the mode of human sense perception changes with humanity's entire mode of existence. The manner in which human sense perception is organized, the medium in which it is accomplished, is determined not only by nature, but by historical circumstances as well. Walter Benjamin then gives credit to the people who had the same thought before him, Alois Riegel and Franz Wyckoff, two scholars of the Viennese school. However far-reaching their insight, these scholars limited themselves to showing the significant formal hallmark which characterized perception in late Roman times. They did not attempt, and perhaps saw no way, to show the social transformations expressed by these changes of perception. The change of the superstructure, about which Walter Benjamin has already talked in the preface, seems to be the starting point of a further investigation by him. The conditions for an analogous insight are more favorable in the present, and if changes in the medium of contemporary perception can be comprehended as decay of the aura, it is possible to show its social causes. Now, if you look for the content, what is Walter Benjamin saying in this chapter? Going back to the beginning of chapter 3, we find out that the manner in which human sense perception is organized, the medium in which it is accomplished, is determined not only by nature, but by historical circumstances as well. If we look at the decay of the aura as an expression of the changes in the superstructure, we can recognize it as a reorganization of the perception. The medium, which is the superstructure, is changing, and therefore perception is reorganizing. And if changes in the medium of contemporary perception can be comprehended as decay of the aura, it is possible to show its social causes. At this point, Walter Benjamin wants to illustrate the aura of historical objects, i.e. works of art, by showing the aura of natural objects. The concept of aura, which was proposed above with reference to historical objects, may usefully be illustrated with reference to the aura of natural ones. The aura of natural objects. We define the aura of the latter as the unique phenomenon of a distance, however close it may be. If, while resting on a summer afternoon, you follow with your eyes a mountain range on the horizon, or a branch which casts its shadow over you, you experience the aura of those mountains, of that branch. This phenomenon of a distance can be attached to works of art as well, to get an idea of the aura. This image makes it easy to comprehend the social basis of the contemporary decay of the aura. 
it rests on two circumstances, both of which are related to the increasing significance of the masses in contemporary life. Namely, the desire of contemporary masses to bring things closer, spatially and humanly, which is just as ardent as their bent toward overcoming the uniqueness of every reality by accepting its reproduction. We have seen in the previous chapter the ability of the reproduction to get consumed in every possible place, at every possible time. Every day, the urge grows stronger to get hold of an object at very close range by way of its likeness, its reproduction. It is not the original that people desire, not the form the art takes, but the content. Unmistakably, reproduction, as offered by picture magazines and newsreels, differs from the image seen by the unarmed eye. Uniqueness and permanence are as closely linked in the latter as are transitoriness and reproducibility in the former, while the original, a work of art which is unique, only exists one time and is therefore trapped in being only in one place at a time, the reproduction liberates the art from this. It can exist everywhere and at any quantity. To pry an object from its shell, to destroy its aura, is the mark of a perception whose sense of the universal equality of things has increased to such a degree that it extracts it even from a unique object by means of reproduction. Even originals can be everywhere since the reproduction can carry the message, the content of the work of art, to every place. The adjustment of reality to the masses and of the masses to reality is a process of unlimited scope, as much for thinking as for perception. The reproduction becomes a commodity for the masses and changes the perception of society forever. In chapter 4, we now dive deeper into the source of the existence of the aura. The uniqueness of a work of art is inseparable from its being embedded in the fabric of tradition. This tradition itself is thoroughly alive and extremely changeable. An ancient statue of Venus, for example, stood in a different traditional context with the Greeks, who made it an object of veneration, than with the clerics of the Middle Ages, who viewed it as an ominous idol. Both of them, however, were equally confronted with its uniqueness, that is, its aura. For Walter Benjamin, the course of the aura lies within the tradition the work of art is embedded in. While the tradition itself changes over time, the uniqueness of the artwork remains. This uniqueness is a concept which can only exist in relation to the society the artwork exists in. This relation has to create a value, which the artwork then carries on. Originally, the contextual integration of art in tradition found its expression in the cult. We know that the earliest artworks originated in the service of a ritual, first the magical, then the religious kind. This is easy to understand if we take a closer look at the earlier example of the statue of Venus. The original ritual function was obviously a religious one. The statue of Venus as a representation of a goddess was of use in a ritual of homage. As time passed on, the form of the cult changed. In the Middle Ages, Greek gods and artworks which represented them were seen as a devilish thing. This, however, was still a religious purpose, still a tradition of dealing with these artworks. It was a ritual. It is significant that the existence of the work of art with reference to its aura is never entirely separated from its ritual function. In other words, the unique value of the authentic work of art has its basis in ritual the location of its original use value. And because the ritual which creates the cult value still existed, the cult value and therefore the aura remained even in the Middle Ages. At this point, dealing with two remarks Walter Benjamin made in this chapter might be the best choice. Remark number 5 talks about how the phenomenon of a distance, however close it may be, we have talked about in chapter 3, is equivalent to the cult value. The cult value as a part of our perception the aura of an artwork and the phenomenon of a distance are all the same things. Quote, remark number five. 
The definition of the aura as a unique phenomenon of a distance, however close it may be, represents nothing but the formulation of the cult value of the work of art in categories of space and time perception. Distance is the opposite of closeness. The essentially distant object is the unapproachable one. Unapproachability is indeed a major quality of the cult image. True to its nature, it remains distant, however close it may be. The closeness, which one may gain from its subject matter, does not impair the distance which it retains in its appearance. End of quote. In remark number 6, Walter Benjamin uses the secularization to describe the changes the cult value experiences after the Middle Ages. During the secularization, the cult value of the art becomes less and less important in the perception of the consumer. In the imagination of the beholder, the uniqueness of the phenomena which holds sway in the cult image is more and more displaced by the empirical uniqueness of the creator or of his creative achievement. To be sure, never completely so, the concept of authenticity always transcends mere genuineness. This is particularly apparent in the collector, who always retains some traces of the fetishist and who, by owning the work of art, shares in its ritual power. While authenticity becomes more and more important in the perception of the consumer, the aura never perishes. Nevertheless, the function of the concept of authenticity remains determinate in the evaluation of art. With the secularization of art, authenticity displaces the cult value of the work. Although Walter Benjamin talks about authenticity replacing the cult value, here we will still use cult value because Walter Benjamin himself referred only to the cult value after this chapter. Going back to the main text, we can now make more sense of what follows. This ritualistic basis, however remote, is still recognizable as secularized ritual, even in the most profane forms of the cult of beauty. The secular cult of beauty, developed during the Renaissance and prevailing for three centuries, clearly showed that ritualistic basis in its decline and the first deep crisis which befell it. The ritual remained, even though the cult value was replaced by authenticity, which put the uniqueness even more into the center of the arts. This uniqueness was then questioned and started the greatest crisis in the field of arts by photography. With the advent of the first truly revolutionary means of reproduction, photography, simultaneously with the rise of socialism, art sensed the approaching crisis which has become evident a century later. The crisis developed around the question of what uniqueness really means. What is an original? What is the purpose of art if everyone can copy it with photography, etc. This crisis created a reaction in the field of arts. At the time, art reacted with the doctrine of l'art pour l'art, that is, with a theology of art. This gave rise to what might be called a negative theology in the form of the idea of pure art, which not only denied any social function of art, but also any categorizing by subject matter. The thought of l'art pour l'art, which means nothing more than that art should serve the sole purpose of being art and should never serve any other purpose, Walter Benjamin then moves on with his thoughts. An analysis of art in the age of mechanical reproduction must do justice to these relationships, for they lead us to an all-important insight. For the first time in world history, mechanical reproduction emancipates the work of art from its parasitical dependence on ritual. To an ever greater degree, the work of art reproduced becomes the work of art designed for reproducibility. To summarize this shortly, the original function of art was the role in a ritual which created the cult value. With the secularization, the cult value changed to authenticity, while the ritual function remained in a different form, as a profane cult of beauty. The mechanical reproduction is able to free the artwork from its parasitical dependence on ritual. The mechanical reproduction frees the art from the ritual by introducing a new field into the arts. From a photographic negative, for example, one can make any number of prints. To ask for the authentic print makes no sense. But the instant the criterion of authenticity ceases to be applicable to artistic production, the total function of art is reversed. Instead of being based on ritual, it begins to be based on another practice. Politics. 
In the last remark in this chapter, Walter Benjamin gives an interesting insight into the role of the film during the late 1920s and early 1930s. First of all, he distinguishes the film from other forms of mechanical reproduction, because it does not reproduce already existing art, but is made to be art itself. Quote from remark number 7. In case of films, mechanical reproduction is not, as with literature and painting, an external condition for mass distribution. Mechanical reproduction is inherent in the very technique of film production. This technique not only permits in the most direct way, but virtually causes mass distribution. End of quote. He then goes on with an economic analysis of the film industry in these times. He argues that the film has to reach a large audience in order to match the high production costs. The sound film created a barrier between the nations due to different languages, but these barriers were then toppled by synchronization. Walter Benjamin shows here a link between the rise of fascism and the rise of the sound film. Both gained a source of support because of the world's economic crisis in 1929. Quote, again from remark number 7. With the sound film, to be sure, a setback in its international distribution occurred at first. Audiences became limited by language barriers. This coincided with the fascist emphasis on national interests. It is more important to focus on this connection with fascism than on the setback, which was soon minimized by synchronization. The simultaneity of both phenomena is attributable to the depression, the same disturbances which, on a larger scale, led to an attempt to maintain the existing property structure by sheer force led the endangered film capital to speed up the development of the sound film. The introduction of the sound film brought about a temporary relief, not only because it again brought the masses into the theaters, but also because it merged new capital from the electrical industry with that of the film industry. End of quote. With other words, the crisis and the existence of socialism was a threat to the existence of property rights, which fascism could solve by upholding the property rights with state force. And the crisis forced the film industry to develop the new technology of the sound film in order to expand. The fifth chapter of the artwork essay brings up the exhibition value as the polar opposite of the cult value. Works of art are received and valued on different planes. Two polar types stand out. With one, the accent is on the cult value. With the other, on the exhibition value of the work. In the ritual and the from the ritual emerging cult value, the work of art has its original purpose and value. Judging from remark number 8, Walter Benjamin found this thought already in the works of Hegel. Pause. At this point, Walter Benjamin quotes from one of the several German editions of Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history. I would like to quote directly from a translation of the whole passage. However, Walter Benjamin uses the edition of the lectures edited by Eduard Ganz, while all English translations I could find worked with the version made by Karl Hegel, the son of Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. This brings up the problem that the whole passage Walter Benjamin is quoting from here is missing in that edition. Therefore, we have to stick to the English translation of the artwork essay I am working with, which was translated by Harry Son and edited by Hannah Arendt. Quoting from remark number 8, where Walter Benjamin quotes from Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Quote, Images were known of old. Piety, at an early time, required them for worship but it could do without beautiful images. These might even be disturbing. In every beautiful painting there is also something non-spiritual, merely external, but its spirit speaks to man through its beauty. Worshipping, conversely, is concerned with the work as an object, for it is but a spiritless stupor of the soul. Fine art has arisen in the church, although it has already gone beyond its principle as art. End of quote. As we can see, Hegel used different notions, but described the same development. Art served a ritual function in worshipping, but moved beyond the religious state and found a new cult in the beauty of art itself. Now back to the video. Going back to the main text, what Walter Benjamin wants to say us up to this point is the following. 
Despite the cult value being historically the first use value of the artwork, this does not mean that there was no exhibition value in early works of art. In the main text, Walter Benjamin gives the example of a cave painting, which although it was meant to fulfill a magical or religious purpose, was also exhibited and could be perceived by the people. He explains this further in remark number 8. The transition from the first kind of artistic reception to the second characterizes the history of artistic reception in general. Apart from that, a certain oscillation between these two polar modes of reception can be demonstrated for each work of art. As a specific example, he uses the Sistine Madonna by Raphael. It was made for the purpose of exhibition, and it was used as such for the public lying in state of Pope Sixties. Afterwards, it was brought into a monastery to be kept on the altar. Again from remark number 8. The reason for this exile is to be found in the Roman rites, which forbid the use of paintings exhibited at obsequies as cult objects on the high altar. This regulation devalued Raphael's picture to some degree. In order to obtain an adequate price nevertheless, the papal see resolved to add to the bargain the tacit toleration of the picture above the high altar. To avoid attention, the picture was given to the monks of the far-off provincial town. End of quote. Back in the main text, Walter Benjamin argues as following. Today the cult value would seem to demand that the work of art remains hidden. Certain statues of gods are accessible only to the priest in the cellar. Certain Madonnas remain covered nearly all year round. Certain sculptures on medieval cathedrals are invisible to the spectator on ground level. With the emancipation of the various art practices from ritual, go increasing opportunities for the exhibition of their product. This is the continuation of his thoughts regarding the cult value from the previous chapter. The mechanical reproduction which liberates the artwork from the ritual, and therefore from the cult value, also increases the exhibition value. It is easier to exhibit a portrait bust that can be sent here and there, than to exhibit the statue of a divinity that has its fixed place in the interior of the temple. However, today's changes not only affect cult value or exhibition value, but the character of art itself. With the different methods of technical reproduction of a work of art, its fitness for exhibition increased to such an extent that the quantitative shift between its two poles turned into a qualitative transformation of its nature. This is comparable to the situation of the work of art in prehistoric times when, by the absolute emphasis on its cult value, it was, first and foremost, an instrument of magic. Only later did it come to be recognized as a work of art. In the same way today, by the absolute emphasis on its exhibition value, the work of art becomes a creation with entirely new functions, among which the one we are conscious of, the artistic function, later may be recognized as incidental. The means of mechanical reproduction which are able to show this are according to Valde Benjamin the photography and the film, which brings us to the next chapter. Chapter 6. The last chapter we will cover in this video starts with a return to the first truly revolutionary means of reproduction, as Walter Benjamin called photography. In photography, exhibition value begins to displace cult value all along the line, but cult value does not give away without resistance. Although the reproduction of art starts to replace the cult value by the exhibition value, there is a force within photography preserving the cult value and the ritual. For now. Quote, it retires into an ultimate retrenchment, the human countenance. It is no accident that the portrait was the first focal point of early photography, the cult of remembrance of loved ones, absent or dead, offers a last refuse for the cult value of the picture. For the last time, the aura emanates from the early photographs in the fleeting expression of a human face. This is what constitutes a melancholy, incomparable beauty. But as man withdraws from the photographic image, the exhibition value for the first time shows its superiority to the ritual value. End of quote. So, despite the photography being the first modern means of art with the intended and inherent purpose to be reproduced, the cult value remained. Photography's function is not that of a ritual, but the existence as a mass-reproduced and mass-consumed work of art. 
However, the perception of the people was not ready yet, since the ritual took over the photography because of its realistic picturing of people, lasting longer than a human lifespan. The process in which the picture was left without humans has to be understood as the turning point. Photography of objects, landscapes, scenarios, this kind of art cannot be part of a ritual, of a cult. The exhibition value triumphs over the cult value in this process. Quote, to have pinpointed this new stage constitutes the incomparable significance of Atget, who, around 1900, took photographs of deserted Paris streets. It has quite justly been said of him that he photographed them like scenes of crime. The scene of a crime, too, is deserted. It is photographed for the purpose of establishing evidence. With Atget, photographs become standard evidence for historical occurrences and acquire a hidden political significance. They demand a specific kind of approach. Free-floating contemplation is not appropriate to them. They stir the viewer. He feels challenged by them in a new way. End of quote. In order to understand artworks which are shaped completely by exhibition value, the old perception which still focuses on cult and ritual is useless. Walter Benjamin calls this free-floating contemplation which means the merging of one's mind into the artwork without any basis or knowledge about it. We will talk about this topic later, when it comes up again. In the end, Walter Benjamin talks about the usage of photography in the press. As we have seen in chapter 1, newspapers are a good, produced for the masses, able to be read anywhere, at any time. Photography within a newspaper or magazine is never a whole alone. While a painting cannot represent a realistic picture of reality, a photo is able to do so. Captions or headlines merge with the photo in the newspapers or magazines. By doing so, they carry a common message to the consumer. This is a great example of, of what Walter Benjamin described earlier in chapter 3 when he talked about the liberation of art. The focus changes to the message once the cult is abolished. They demand a specific kind of approach. Free-floating contemplation is not appropriate to them. They stir the viewer. He feels challenged by them in a new way. At the same time, picture magazines begin to put up signposts for him. Right ones or wrong ones, no matter. For the first time, captions have become obligatory, and it is clear that they have an altogether different character than the title of a painting. This becomes even more clear in the film. The directives which the captions give to those looking at the pictures in illustrated magazines soon become even more explicit and more imperative in the film, where the meaning of each single picture appears to be a bit prescribed by the sequence of all preceding ones. Summary Since this video is already too long, here are again the core arguments of all chapters so far. Preface the superstructure, and in particular the sphere of arts, changes slower than the base. Analyzing the transformation of art can give us information about the transformation of society as a whole. Chapter 1. Technical or mechanical reproduction as a term describes two kinds of art. First, already existing forms of art get confronted with the possibilities of mechanical reproduction. The most prominent examples is printing as the means of reproduction for script or photography for paintings. Secondly, the mechanical reproduction creates and becomes art. This was true for a long time, since the mechanical reproduction of bronzes, terracottas and coins was already known in ancient Greece. Photography as the first truly revolutionary means of reproduction is another example. In general, quote, to an ever greater degree, the work of art reproduced becomes the work of art designed for reproducibility. End of quote. Chapter 2. The uniqueness of a work of art is composed of its material, its physical existence, and the relationships the artwork undergoes during this existence. Walter Benjamin describes both the physical and the social existence as the essence of all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its substantive duration to its testimony to the history it has experienced. This social existence, the sum of all relationships and all the history it experienced, is based upon the material the physical existence of the artwork. But the mechanical reproduction undermines this physical existence in two ways. 
A mechanical reproducible artwork does not know an original. It can't experience authority of one of its copies. Secondly, the existence is not unique. Mechanical reproduction means mass production. Mass production implies mass consumption, anywhere, anytime. Both of these processes destroy the unique physical existence of an artwork. Therefore, they also destroy the social existence. Walter Benjamin subsumes this destruction of the two components of the uniqueness as the withering of the aura. Chapter 3 Along with the transformation of society, the perception of the people also changes. Especially the perception of art is affected. This perception is organized through the medium of the superstructure. Walter Benjamin illustrates the aura of artworks through the comparison with the aura of natural objects. The withering of the aura expresses the tendency of society to overcome the unique. In this case, to overcome the uniqueness of artworks. This is only possible with the means of mechanical reproduction. To pry an object from its shell, to destroy its aura, shows how the change of perception in the medium of the superstructure is reorganized, until the sense of the universal equality of things has increased to such a degree that it extracts it even from a unique object by means of reproduction. Chapter 4 during the course of history, the tradition in which the work of art was embedded in changed multiple times. The uniqueness of an artwork, its aura, depended on the ritual for the most time. This ritual often played also a religious role. The value the work of art received by being part of the ritual is called cult value by Walter Benjamin. The world, however, emancipated itself more and more from religion, so it was clear that the sphere of art also underwent this secularization. The ritual and the cult values themselves remained, but the latter changed its form and became authenticity, freed from religious attachments. With the rise of photography, the uniqueness of art was questioned at its core and pushed the sphere of arts into a deep crisis. It reacted with the rise of l'art polar, a sort of theology of art, which only allows art to have no other purpose aside from being art. Mechanical reproduction attacked the uniqueness directly and emancipated and emancipates the work of art from its parasitical dependence on ritual. Walter Benjamin thinks that politics will replace the ritual as the base of art. Chapter 5 the reception of art always had two opposite aspects. Either the focus was on the cult value or on the exhibition value. Although a work of art is embedded in a tradition which favors only one of these, the mechanical reproduction works best as exhibition value, while the cult value forces the artwork into hiding, only accessible for few people. The exhibition value on the other side seeks to let everyone participate in the reception of the art. This increase in possibilities of exhibition created a qualitative jump which broadens the functions of art. Chapter 6 The exhibition value of photography drives back the cult value. The aura finds its last resort in the cult of photographies of human faces. But if the human element in photography is put in the background or removed completely, it becomes clear that the floating contemplation as the dominating way of perceiving art, which means the contemplation without any previous information or deeper understanding, is not suitable for perceiving mechanically reproduced artworks. In newspapers and magazines additional information are given, besides the photographs, in form of descriptions and headlines, leading to a merging of both to carry one single idea, one common message. This makes possible a new understanding of reproduction. Wow, this was a long video. Uh, sorry for the long time you have to wait for it to come out. Um, it took two years to produce it, uh, because I made some mistakes on the way you know I, I wrote a script but then i but then i changed the script while i was working on the earlier part of this video it was a mess i'm sorry for that but i learned from my mistakes and i will try to stick to my original script in the future so i hope i can make videos faster we will see after two years working on only this project I hope I am allowed to make some other smaller projects first before I return to Walter Benjamin and the artwork essay. I'm sorry for that, but 
I, I just want to get things done first before I return. But I want to return. I definitely want to return to, to this topic. I swear I will. If you have complaints about anything, <laughs> leave them in the comments. If you found some logical errors or misinterpretations, I want to read all of that. Uh, please write it in the comments. Thanks for watching the whole thing and until next time. Bye.